Hey, fellas, how are you? How you doing, guys? Word of the Father. I don't know the rest of his words. I just know. Born the King of Angels. Oh, come, let us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore him. Rise the Lord. All right, folks. Hopefully, we'll see who's going to show up. Hey, friend, you made it for the session, medic. Lord willing, I'm going to have to go through my block list and unblock people. Oh, my goodness. Ah, what's up? I'm alive. Yeah, I'm alive. 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 I forgot what is my dream. So okay, Lemon After the after I finish this, I'll call you. You know, watch me live. Right. Yellow. Right. Word of the Father. And then I part of like born the king of. See, this is what's beautiful about live stream. Things happen. You get phone calls from people you haven't heard from a while. You know, you gotta make a run to the kitchen. Yeah, you know, this is what's beautiful about live streams. Right. Besides the fact I'm I'm beautiful. Save the drama for your mama. Word of the Father. Hopefully, by the grace of Jesus Christ, our Lord, we're going to go out with a bang, you know, a spiritual bang by the power of the Holy Spirit. This is the last session for this year. And I won't see you guys till next year. Kanye, a blessed New Year 2020 from U.S. and Singapore, Sam. I won't see you till next year. This is our last session for the year. Bada bang, bada boom. Singapore. Connie, Lord Jesus bless you. I'd like to come and check out Singapore. I'd like to come and check out China and Hong Kong. I'd like to really go to these places, particularly Hong Kong. I don't think I could come to Pakistan guiding the way. God bless you and preserve you. The Lord Jesus preserved the church in Pakistan. The Lord Jesus preserved the church in India. The Lord Jesus preserved the church in China, the Lord Jesus preserve his church, his people, and all the lands that they are being persecuted for the glory of Jesus. The Lord Jesus fill them with the Spirit, seal them by the Spirit, and give them faith to move mountains, to never deny or betray the Lord Jesus. And I pray that for ourselves as well in Jesus' name. I don't think I can come to Indonesia. The Lord Jesus protect the church in Indonesia. Not because I don't want to come. I don't think they'll have me there. You heard about that amazing, bold witness for Jesus in China. That pastor who's now been sentenced, what was it, nine years? I think I recall it said nine years. Pray for the persecuted church. What's up, Lisa? I don't know if you pronounce it Lisa or Lisa. Wasn't there a singer by the name of Lisa? Oh, yeah, my baby. Oh, Liza? Like Liza Minnelli? Liza Minnelli? Lizia, Zia, Lizia, you pronounce your last name like Zia? All right, Liza, yeah, Lizia, okay, Lizia, Lizia, all right, yeah, that's a unique name. Your name is often imitated, never duplicated. But wasn't there a singer? I remember she used to sing, I think, Heartbreak. Can you feel the beat within my heart? I don't know the words, a lot of the words I don't know. I can do Mona Lisa, Mona Lisa. Mm, oh, I can't do the low pitch. I can do the high one. Yeah, what was her name? It was never you. Then who was it if it was never me? You know, I hate that, Nick. You know why? That's what usually a girl says when she wants to break up with a guy that she doesn't love. It was never you. It was me. It, it, it's never you. It's me. It, it, there's something about me. I just... It's, it, you, you're, there's nobody like you. You're the best. But it's just something in me. And then next week, she's with another guy. Right? Is that why you, your name is never you? <laughs> right? You guys know what I'm talking about? Right? You guys, pre-Christian days, right? Before we were Christians. When you didn't know how to act, you didn't know how to play the game. Pre-Christian days. You know, now in Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit, we don't do that anymore. In Jesus Christ's name. We who love Jesus, there is no sex before marriage. And I need to emphasize that. If you are a Christian and you love Jesus, let me share some with you. 
If you are in a sexual relationship, repent. I want to emphasize this because I don't think I emphasize this enough. You cannot profess Jesus Christ and love him and be sexually active outside the confines of marriage. The only sexual intimacy you can have is with your spouse of the opposite gender. God only blesses male and female intimate sexual relationship in the confines of marriage. If you profess to be Jesus and you're active with someone sexually before marriage, repent, ask Jesus to forgive you and give you the power of the Holy Spirit. Because if you love Jesus and we love Jesus, we will die to our needs and desires and trust the spirit to sustain us. Okay. Let me just emphasize that because I don't think I emphasize that enough. And I know people professing to be Christians who are actively sexually involved with their partners. They're not married and they still go to church and lift hands. So and I pray if you're listening to this and that's you, may the spirit convict you and draw you to the feet of Jesus to repent in Jesus name. May he keep us all pure sexually, physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually for the glory of Jesus. So I just want to emphasize that, emphasize that. Pray for me, pray for one another, that we die to ourselves, crucify our flesh, and walk in the life of the Spirit for the glory of Jesus. All right? Uh, Liza, to have a close, intimate relationship with someone that's not sexual, if it's not for the purpose of marriage, why would you do that to yourself? Liza just asked a good question. If there's someone that you're in love with, but you're not sexually active, is that someone that you're going to marry? Or are you going to continue loving that person and that person doesn't love you in response, but is going to move on and find someone to marry? So why are you, why are you hurting yourself by pursuing someone and loving someone that doesn't love you? Right? I know I called you. I said Liza, like Liza Minnelli. Time to say goodbye. But mommy and all. Yeah, but yeah, I like that, Nick, that sister in the Lord. Well, sister, you know, can I say something with you, Liza? Let me share something with you. You are actually shortchanging and dishonoring the man that God may have for you. Let me tell you why. Let me tell you. You're in love with someone else that doesn't love you. That's obviously not of the Lord. Okay, so by being in love with someone that doesn't love you, you are now shortchanging and robbing the man that God may have for you because you've given your heart to someone that you're not supposed to and you dishonor him. How can that person, if God has someone for you, how can that person trust you when you're in love with someone else? Right? Can I ask you a question, Liza? Since we're bringing it up, we're going to come into the subject. Subject. Imagine you fell in love with a man of God who married you, but then you realize that man of God has been in love with someone else other than you, and <clears throat> his prayer was that person would be a spouse. The Wouldn't that make you feel second best? Wouldn't that make you feel like you are a rebound? He couldn't have the woman he wanted, so he settled for you. Right? So that's very disrespectful, dishonorable to that man that God may have for you. So I don't know. I don't know. And one thing I can tell you, Liza, don't lie, but don't tell. Let me explain this to you guys. There is a principle, and I don't want you to guys, I don't want you guys, I don't want you guys to misuse this principle. Please hear me carefully. I'm begging the Holy Spirit to guide me into all truth, to save me from error to sanctify us, to be in love with Jesus Christ, to worship Jesus Christ, and live for Jesus Christ. There is a principle that you'll find in Scripture. Don't lie, don't tell. You are not permitted to lie, as the Lord Jesus grants me perfect sight spiritually and physically, especially into his word. But you're not obligated to always tell someone all the details. Don't lie, don't tell. Meaning, don't lie to someone, but you don't have to tell them all the details. You know, you find this in Scripture where prophets of God do not lie to people, but they don't tell them the whole story with God's approval. 1 Samuel 16 is a case in point. When God commissions Samuel to anoint David, Samuel, read 1 Samuel 16. Don't take my word for it. 
Samuel tells God, if Saul hears about it, he may try to kill me. I'm giving you the gist. I'm summing up. He goes, well, if anyone asks you, tell them that you're going to Jesse's house to sacrifice. Right? To sacrifice. Which he did. He was not lying. Because part of the anointing of David included a sacrifice. Right? A festal sacrifice to the God who'd raised up David. That's 1 Samuel 16. So I'm not making this up, but in Jesus' name, by the power of the Spirit, don't abuse and misuse this principle. There are times in which it is not necessary. In fact, it'd be counterproductive for you to give too much details. You are not permitted to lie. So I'm not saying lie. I'm saying you don't have to lie, but you don't have to give all the details. Now, why, why am I saying this? I'm saying this for the case of Liza. Liza, you will probably hurt the man of God if he knows you've been in love with someone for all this time. So the best thing to do, ask Jesus to remove that man from your heart. Die to him completely. And until you're dead to him, don't pursue a relationship with anyone else when your heart belongs to someone else because that's a dishonor to that man of God. But once God heals you of that and you have no feelings for that person anymore and God brings a person in your life, you don't need to tell him that you're in love with this man. You don't need to tell him you're in love with this man. You don't lie to him, but you don't need to bring it up. But one thing I'm going to say as a brother to you, okay? One thing I'm going to say as a brother to you, Liza. As a brother, here's what I'm going to say to you. Do not pursue any man until God removes this man from your heart and he's completely removed and you're dead to him because you will be dishonoring that man of God, right? Right? By not giving him your, your whole undivided love. Right? Are you listening to me? Was that clear to the rest of you? Pray. Yesterday we had 150. I pray we're going to have 300. And it's not about numbers. I just want a lot more sincere students of the word that God can use me to bless them. And if he doesn't want to bring them, that's fine. That's right, Liza. Don't pursue anyone until that man is removed because you've been living a fantasy. You've made a man an idol because he's the focus of your heart, and that's sin. You're pursuing a man in love with a man that doesn't love you. What's wrong with you? What's wrong with you is that you're a human being fallen, and you're a creature, and you're a woman. And I'm not saying this to attack you. I'm a man. You're a woman. Let me unpack a secret of Scripture. And it's not really a secret, but it's secret to many. Okay? Guys, don't... Go into side talks and tangents. Focus. Let me get my coffee. Hold on. I want to get my coffee. Okay. Let me get my coffee. I, I had I told Liza she is a perfect example of Genesis 3.16. Brah. What's up, Pedro? What's up, brah? I love when he says brah. Okay. I had told her I was going to unpack Genesis 3.16. So let me unpack it for her. I said, if you want, you can call me and we'll unpack it. Genesis 3.16. Let's read this. Read, read with me and we'll begin. This is will be preparatory. Let's pray for a supernatural, powerful anointing. This is the last session of this year. Pray the Spirit fills us with such power to glorify Jesus, to go out with a bang. This is the last session of this year. And I won't see you guys till next year. I don't mean to break your hearts, but you won't see me till next year. So you're going to have to live with it. Well, as I said, we can I can talk to you about it, but you're just too you're just too reserved to talk. Oh, I me call you, talk to you, never Sam. All right, anyway. Genesis 3:16. Okay, Genesis 3:16. Let's read it. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. Pay attention, you guys really need to pay attention to this. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Pay attention. This is a judgment scene. God is saying, because you sinned, here's your discipline, here's your judgment. Your judgment, woman, is that you'll desire your husband, and he will rule over you. Now, you think this is positive. A woman desiring her husband, that's beautiful. No, not in this context. Remember, it's a judgment scene where God is disciplining them for sinning. So 
Desiring her husband is not something positive. It's the context of judgment. Let me show you the two words, desire and rule, used in the very next chapter. Genesis chapter 4, verse 7. Exactly walking in the light. Man, brother, I love you, man. I don't know if you're a brother or sister, but I still love you. You know what I'm saying? It's platonic. Genesis 4, verse 7. If thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted. God talking to Cain. If you do what is right, you'll be accepted, Cain. And if thou doest not well, if you don't do what is good, sin lieth at the door. So he describes sin like a demon, as a spiritual being. And it's crouching at your door. And unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. Bam! The same two Hebrew words. Did you catch it? Same two Hebrew words. Cain, sin desires you, you have to rule over it. Do you think that's positive? Do you think... The desire of sin for Cain is a good thing or a bad thing? Is it good or bad? Thank you, medic. Of course it's a bad thing, Johannes 14.6. I am the way, the truth, and life. Sin desires to control you. Sin desires to ensnare you. Sin desires to own you. And until sin <clears throat> ensnares you, it will always pursue you. That's you, Lisa. Because of God's discipline on Adam and Eve, relationships between males and females are messed up. So a woman is going to desire to control a man and won't stop desiring him until she controls him. And as long as she doesn't control him, she won't stop wanting him. That's you. And guys, let's be honest, pre-Christian and even in, as Christians, how many times have you seen a woman desire a man that doesn't want her or mistreats her, but the man who worships the ground she walks on, she could care less for? Vice versa, right? How many times do you find a man disrespecting a woman that worships the ground he walks on, treating her like garbage, playing her. But the woman that plays him, he goes nuts over her. That's what Genesis 3.16 is saying. Liza, the fact that you desire to have someone that you can't have, that's sin in itself. That's sin in itself. Because you're not free to pursue the one that God has for you. And as long as you're not free to pursue the one that God has for you, he won't bring him to you. You see my point? So what God is saying is, because of sin, women will desire to ensnare men. They're going to try to take men captive, control them. And once they have them, they have no respect for that man. And a man will rule a, a woman, just like Cain is to rule sin. That's not good, right? Cain is to conquer sin, vanquish sin subjugate sin that's what is going to happen between men and women a man is going to just vanquish a woman conquer a woman subjugate a woman treat her like nothing and a woman's going to desire that man she can't have it's only in christ that he restores the relationship between men and women the way it was supposed to be before sin entered the picture it's in christ that a woman by the power of the Holy Spirit dies to her sinful inclination to control and ensnare a man. And it's in Christ that a man filled with the Spirit doesn't desire to conquer his wife, vanquish his wife, belittle his wife, but to serve her and honor her for the sake of the Lord. And reality proves the Bible is 150% true. The Bible is God's word, the creator of heaven and earth, who knows the human condition better than anyone. So the Bible reflects reality. That's why your experience confirms the truth of this passage. Right? Thank you, Patrick Colley. I don't know why you're so fascinated with how healthy I look. Right? So, folks, once you see, for the men, this is for the men. Once you see a woman that's playing hard to get, your natural desire will be to pursue her. But more, the more you pursue her, the less she'll want you. When you stop pursuing her, 
guess what happens? She gets discombobulated, can't believe what's happening, and then she wants you all of a sudden. Wow. What a messed up world. What a messed up world, right? Right? Even as believers, we struggle with that. You may have women that throw themselves at your feet. You don't care for them. But you want that one that doesn't want you. And the woman may have an amazing man of God pursuing her, but she doesn't want him because her eyes are is, is on that one individual that doesn't give her the time of day. This is where you have to ask the Holy Spirit to sanctify you. Holy Spirit, sanctify me. Crucify my flesh. Transform me to desire what Jesus desires for me, right? And to go against my natural sinful instinct. Exactly, Starwalker. We know we weren't always believers. I used to be in the world. I mean, unfortunately. Right? Exactly, Guy Wilkerson. Girls want bad boys. And I see it even now. People who profess to be Christian, especially women, I see it right now. Women who profess to be Christian, who love the Lord, and wonder why the men that they've been with mistreat them and dump them, and still pursuing bad boys because they have a desire to tame that bad boy, control that bad boy, and change him. But that's only temporary. It's in the honeymoon phase. Once that honeymoon phase dissipates, then the bad boy comes to the surface and starts treating that girl like garbage. It's inevitable because if you're not in Jesus, it's inevitable that someone is going to misuse the other. It's in Jesus that constrains us from doing that. And do you think the Lord's going to honor that man who's in a relationship with a woman who's less than godly or honor that woman who's in a relationship with someone who's far from Christ? Ain't happening. It's not going to happen. Let's look at Ecclesiastes 7.26 real quickly. By the way, is the Bible amazing or what? The Bible has all the answers, and it's supernatural because it's the word of the true God who truly lives. It's amazing, right? Exactly, Melanie Max. Say that to Liza. Liza's in love with a guy that doesn't love her. She's made him an idol, and she can't break free from him. All right? Notice here, Liza, was good. at least she's respecting the Lord. I realized that I still desired the one man that I can't get over. And so I recently completely just stopped dating an old friend who was marriage-minded. You see? All this time she was with someone who wanted to marry her, but her heart was somewhere else. You need to die to that because now it's becoming sin. Ecclesiastes 7.26. Ecclesiastes 7.26. Sorry. Guys, I want to be buffering because I'm in my brother's place, so the intern is not the best. Yep, amen. Cut those connections. Ecclesiastes 726. I love this, folks. Memorize this passage, men and women, because it's also applicable to women. Pay attention, folks. And I find more bitter than death the woman whose heart is snares and nets and her hands as bands. Whoso pleases God shall escape from her, but the sinner shall be taken by her. Now, this also applies to men ensnaring women. Don't you love that passage? If you please the Lord and delight the Lord, he will save you from that woman that desires to ensnare you. Same thing with the woman. If you are a woman who pleases the Lord, he'll save you from the man who desires to vanquish you. Okay? So I hope that was clear. So, Liza, time to repent, sister. Time to die to this man that you made an idol and seek the Lord. Um, Mosel Beat, I will be doing a series on Isaiah 714. I have some articles on my website. So God willing, next year, I won't see you till next year, I'll be doing a series on Isaiah 714, Lord willing. But for now, I will be focusing on this article of mine. I run the blog, answeringislamblog.wordpress.com. So pray for my ministry, pray for the websites that I run, pray for God blessing me with wisdom and knowledge from the Spirit to produce top-notch articles and rebuttals and videos for the glory of Jesus. 
This is the article that the series is based on. Here it is. Let me give you the link. I'll post it three times because we're Trinitarian, right? Okay. This is the article that the series is based on. Whose glory did Isaiah see? So all this information is in that article. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to pray the Holy Spirit helps me to help you to interpret Scripture correctly, to recall Scripture perfectly, and then by the power of the Holy Spirit to absorb this information, memorize this information, make it second nature, understand it, and then share it. Share it. Hit the like button. Pass these videos and articles. Download the videos to your YouTube channels. Print out the Distribute them. Teach them in your Sunday school and your Bible classes. This information is for you to be used to glorify the triune God. This information is for you to be used to glorify the triune God. Use my information. Take it. Print it. Distribute it. Use it in your Bible studies, in your Sunday school. Use it for the glory of Jesus Christ. All right? And hit the like button and pray that we can make this YouTube channel skyrocket and go viral with serious, sincere students of the word. As the Spirit uses me to bless you, if the Lord wants to use me in the upcoming year. What's up, my brother? God bless you. Good to see you. So hopefully Genesis 3.16 will sink in to you men and women who are not married. Right? Do not pursue the one that has no interest in you. Ask God to show you if he has someone for you and to reveal who that person is and Honor that person for the sake of Jesus. Don't play games. Don't play games. I know it's hard. I know it's hard. We're human, and we desire that which we can't have, unfortunately. And that goes back to the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve didn't desire what they could have. They desired the one thing they couldn't have. See, that's part of sin, right? Adam and Eve, they had all the trees before them, a perfect garden, a beautiful garden, plenty of trees to eat and delight themselves with. But they desired the one tree they couldn't have. Right? They desired the one tree they couldn't have. Isn't that amazing? And we are sons and daughters of Adam and Eve. We desire that one individual we can have. But that's where the Holy Spirit comes and crucifies our flesh, transforms us to stop desiring that which God doesn't intend for us. Right? Clear? That's clear? Lena, I don't blame you. You know what's shocking? I'm going to let the cat out of the bag. I decided to put on my Facebook status, Sam Shimon, in a relationship. <sighs> And Facebook decided to make a public post saying Sam Shimon is in a relationship. You should see how many people were thank you know congratulating me. I'm in a relationship with Jesus Christ. I did that because I'm asking God to give me the grace to be content and not pursue marriage. Because to be honest with you, I, I'm being honest. I just don't think marriage is for me. So I'm asking the Lord to give me the grace of contentment. All I want, if the Lord is pleased, to raise up my daughters and be Jesus to them and see them grow up and I die before them and go to be with the Lord, right? So I did that just, you know, if there's anyone who has an interest, realize I'm in a relationship with Jesus and it will be a miracle from the Lord for me to even consider to be with someone because I see how hard relationships are. I see so much brokenness in marriages, even among professing Christians. And I've seen the damage it does to kids. I don't want to contribute to that, right? So, exactly, Justin. Ben Malik is in a relationship with Shimon. And I wasn't lying. Remember I said, don't lie, don't tell? I am in a relationship with my God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Right? Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Anyway, with that said, let's begin. In Jesus' name, Lord, bring your people that you want to be here to listen. We love you, Father. Well, I was, you see, Sai Christian thinks I was with a chick. I was actually with a chick track, you see? Chick track. See, this work. Sai Christian can't get his facts straight. Someone saw me with a chick track, and they said, hey, man, Sam Shimon was with a chick. Yeah, I was with a chick. Chick tracks. <laughs> Hey, just let you guys know again, 
if you see me bantering with Sai Christian, and if you see me bantering with Al D, Al D and Sai Christian are from my neck of the woods. I won't say where. We're actually, we go back teenage years, pre-Christian days. So now Sai Christian is a Syrian brother in Christ, and Al D is an Assyrian brother in Christ. And we're actually homies. We go way back. They knew me before my Christian days. So here they are, hearing a guy that they knew was in the hood. Not that I was a gangbanger or some tough guy, but I wasn't in the faith. Put it that way, right? And now here they are, listening to one of their homies, serving Jesus, preaching the gospel. And here they are, in love with Jesus. So pray for Sai Christian. Pray for Al Dariush. Sai Christian's got six children. Pray God blesses his six children, watches over them and seals them. Al Dariush has five children. Pray that God will bless his five children, one daughter, three boys. Watch over them, preserve them for the glory of Jesus, right? So with that said, Father, we love you. Lord Jesus, we love you. Holy Spirit, we love you. Bless this session. Anoint me with wisdom and knowledge and power from the Spirit to recall and interpret Scripture perfectly. Guide this conversation to be used to bless your people. Fill them with with the spirit and power and life and knowledge and wisdom from the spirit, that this session will be mighty in the spirit as this is the last session of this year. <clears throat> Anoint me, Father, with clarity of thought and speech and save me from error, stammering and confusion. Anoint us, every one of us here. Bless us and flood us and our loved ones. Flood my daughters, my angels, whom you love and adore. Flood us all in the love of Jesus and cover us with the blood of Jesus and seal us by your spirit and have your way, Father. And bless the internet connection. And use my meager efforts to advance the kingdom of your beloved son, Jesus Christ, the God-man, the Lord of glory, the King of kings and Lord of lords. We love you, Abba. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name. All right. We're going to continue where I left off. And what's the point? And by the way, Lord willing, if God is pleased again, if he confirms to me he wants me to continue to do ministry and provides because remember, in ministry, we need provisions by his grace. I will do a series on the Nicene Creed. Someone asked me, can you do a series on the biblical basis for the Nicene Creed? Lord willing, I'm going to do that. There was also another series I wanted to do. I will do a series on Isaiah 714, the prophecy of the virgin who will conceive. Is that a genuine prophecy of the virginal conception and birth of Jesus? Yes. I'll do a series on that, God willing. I'll finish my series on Jesus not being the Archangel Michael. And my series on Jesus being depicted as God in the Synoptic Gospels and other topics. And also be doing a series refuting objections against the Christian faith by Joe's Witnesses. Muslims will look at various arguments. In fact, you know what's interesting I just found out? You know what I just found out? I just found out that oneness heretic, that pastor that I debated in Florida, where by the grace of God, and I'm going to say it, he got decimated and annihilated. He realized he got decimated so badly by the true God, the chime God. Yep. Stephen Ritchie, he just did a five-part series trying to respond to my arguments in the debate, showing he realized he got humiliated. After the debates, I haven't even paid him attention. But someone just brought to my attention, I just saw on his YouTube channel, there's now, I think, five parts where he's refuting my so-called misinterpretation of Scripture. What does that tell you when a guy has to come and do a multi-part series on a debate that he challenged me on to try to go into damage control? That means he realizes that even his fan base saw he got decimated, glory to the triumph God, because he worships a false god. I have no respect for people like that, right? Right? Have you noticed after the debate, I never even addressed them? Because once I'm usually when I'm done with someone to debate, I don't waste my time with that individual. I try to let the debates, I try to let the debate speak for themselves. But what does that tell you that I'm now in his head? I'm a nightmare to him and those heretics, these oneness modalist heretics, that they realize they got to refute me in order to convince their fan base their God is the true God. When it's a false God, a satanic God, the true God is triune and he lives. Shame on him. But anyway, let him do what he wants. Let the dog, dogs bark because that's all they can do. Right? Now, with that said, let's discuss who exactly did Isaiah say, see? 
Let's go to John 12, 36 to 42. John 12, 36 to 42. Yeah. Someone told me the other day in the comment section, hey, did you know? I go, I don't care, man. Let them talk, man. But that just makes me lose respect for them. Right? Yeah, he did. I know first and last. All right. John 12, 36 to 42. Let's unpack one of the, in fact, I don't know if I can say it's the, the theme. One of the major themes of John is to identify Jesus Christ as the Jehovah God Almighty that appeared in the Old Testament. That's a major theme in John. And if you go back to yesterday's session, I gave you some examples where John depicts Jesus as the Jehovah that appeared to Abraham, which we'll get into today, that appeared to Moses, that gave the law to Moses, that appeared to Isaiah and Jeremiah. Yesterday, I focused specifically on Jesus being identified as Jehovah that appeared to Moses and gave him the law and that appeared to Jeremiah. Right? Right. So now, John 12, 36 to 42, thank the admins, first and last, Protestant, and the others like Riaz for helping me to help you and for posting verses. They make my, my job a lot easier, and I really praise God for them. I don't thank them enough even though I can be a thorn in their side. They are really a blessing. God has blessed me with these faithful brothers and sisters to serve me to serve you, right? It's hard to find faithful men and women who will be there for you for the sake of Christ. Very hard. It's rare. It's a rare rarity these days. John 12, 36 to 42. Let's read. While ye have the light, Jesus our Lord speaking, believe in the light that ye may be the children of light. These things spake Jesus and departed and did hide himself from them. But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. They believed not on him. Pay attention. It's all about Jesus. Jesus did miracles. They didn't believe on Jesus. Notice the pronouns. His and him, all Jesus. You can't escape. The him and the his is Jesus. Okay, now, John explains that this was prophesied. Over 700 years ago, the prophet Isaiah prophesied that the Israelites would reject Jesus, but though they he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. Notice 38, that the saying of Esaias the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake, Lord, who hath believed our report, and to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed. So John quotes Isaiah 53 verse 1. Pay attention, ask the Spirit to help us understand. John says, Isaiah 53 1, prophesied. When the Messiah, the servant of Jehovah, the arm of Jehovah appears, who would believe in him? So John is saying, see, they are fulfilling what Isaiah said. The reaction to the Messiah would be. They're fulfilling Isaiah 53 verse 1. But then notice what else he quotes. John 12, 39. Therefore, they could not believe because that Isaiah said again. And now he quotes Isaiah 6 verse 10. Isaiah 6, verse 10. He had blinded their eyes. Pay attention now. He had blinded their eyes, right? And hardened their heart that they should not see with their eyes nor understand with their heart and be converted and I should heal them. Now, 41. John is going to explain why Isaiah spoke about the Messiah. Why? Here's why. Why did Isaiah speak about Messiah being rejected? Because God hardened the hearts of Israel from being able to accept him. Why? Here's why. 41. These things said Esaias when he saw his glory and spake of him. The pronouns, his and him. Just in case you don't know who he's speaking about, he saw his glory and spoke of him. Whose glory did he see? Who did he speak of? You don't need to guess. 42. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers, also many believed on him. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. Okay, did everyone understand that in John 12, 41, John is clear in saying, Isaiah saw the glory of Jesus and spoke of Jesus. He saw his glory and spoke of him. There is no other person in the context. The pronouns him and his all refer to Jesus, who is mentioned in John 12, 37. Jesus is the him and his. It's Jesus' glory that Isaiah saw, which is why he spoke of Jesus. 
And this is why certain translations capture the meaning of the Greek by paraphrasing it. Now, here's my article again. This is all in my article. Let me give you the link. All in my article. Yep, Sammy, I did. So I want to repeat it again. Make it irrefutable, airtight. Okay. You go to my article, I give you a series of citations from various Bible versions bringing out the clear referent of the pronouns that it's Jesus the Messiah. Here you go. I'm going to start posting them one at a time. Here you go. Follow me. Living Bible. Isaiah was referring to Jesus when he made this prediction, for he had seen a vision of the Messiah's glory. Okay? So now some translations are more accurate than others because there's one in particular that may be confusing and misleading. Mounts, William Mounts, a renowned scholar of the Greek New Testament. Here it is. Pay attention. It's all in my article. They're bringing out the import of the Greek, especially the pronouns. Isaiah said these things because he saw Christ's glory and spoke of him. Okay? Names of God Bible. Bear with me because I'm going to make a case slowly, methodically, that's irrefutable to those who have eyes to see and ears to hear. Isaiah said this because he had seen Yeshua's glory and had spoken about him. Names of God Bible. This is all in my article. So we're going to go one at a time. New Life Version. Right? New Life Version. Okay. Let's get there. Bear with me. I repeat myself more than once and go slowly because I want to make sure by the power of the Holy Spirit you get it. This is what Isaiah said when he saw the shining greatness of Jesus and spoke of him. Hmm. Are you seeing a pattern here? New Living Translation. New Living Translation. Now, this one can be a little misleading, but still, nonetheless, it captures the gist of what John said in Greek. Because John wrote in Greek by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Isaiah was referring to Jesus when he said this because he saw the future and spoke of the Messiah's glory. And he and that's true. He did see the future, but also saw the glory of the Messiah revealed to him. But where was it revealed to him? When was it revealed to him? I'll get there. Just bear with me. I hope this is going to bless you because I want to go out with a bang. Here is the note to the Jerusalem Bible. The Jerusalem Bible. The note to the Jerusalem Bible. I didn't quote it, but I gave the note. Okay. Hold on. Let me do this. Okay. Jerusalem Bible. Isaiah was referring to Jesus when he said this because he saw the future and spoke of Messiah's glory. That's New Living Translation. Now, notice the note to the Jerusalem Bible. Isaiah's vision in the temple, Isaiah 6.4, interpreted as a prophetic vision of Christ's glory. Notice it's telling you, this is when Isaiah saw the glory of Christ. He saw his glory in Isaiah 6. And I'm going to come back to that in a minute. Jerusalem Bible. This is the textual note of the New English translation, which is online. You can read for free. I'm going to break it down into two sections. Follow with me. Slowly but surely. I love this passage. It's one of my favorite passages in proving Jesus is Jehovah God of the Old Testament. The Jehovah that the prophets like Isaiah saw. Okay. This is the NET note. I broke it down into two parts because you can only post 200 words at a time. Okay. Follow with me. Okay. Let's read. Greek, his. The referent Christ has been specified in the translation for clarity. The reference supplied here is Christ rather than Jesus because it involves what Isaiah saw. It is clear that the author presents Isaiah as having seen the pre-incarnate glory of Christ, which was the revelation, the very revelation of the Father. The very revelation of the Father. Now, I know most of you know what pre-incarnate means, but for those of you who may not know, let me explain. Pre means before. Pre. Sammy, are you actually pretending to pay attention? Because if you're not, you're insulting me and wasting my time. Pre means before. Incarnate means in the flesh. 
I don't know why Sammy doesn't know where these notes are from when I just said it's from my article and it's from the NET Bible, New English Translation. Unless you're busy playing video games or watching TV or talking, which means that you're wasting your time and mine. Okay? Okay, pre-incarnate means before Jesus came in the flesh. You understand what it means? So here the NET translators are saying, Isaiah saw Jesus in Jesus's pre-human existence. He saw Jesus before Jesus became flesh. That's what pre-incarnate means. Before the enfleshment of Christ, Christ becoming flesh, becoming human. Does everyone understand what that means? Pre, before, incarnate. Incarnate comes from Latin, means in flesh. Like when you speak of something being carnal, you mean fleshly. Right? So notice what it's telling you. Isaiah got to see Jesus before Jesus became human, before Jesus took on flesh. Jesus already appeared to Isaiah long before Jesus became man. So where did Jesus appear to Isaiah before Jesus became flesh? When did Jesus see Jesus? I'm sorry, John, Isaiah, Lord, loosen my tongue. Holy Spirit, take over for the glory of Jesus. Too many J's in that sentence. When did Isaiah the prophet see the pre-human Jesus, Jesus in his pre-human existence? You don't need to guess. Let's go to John 12, 40 to 41 one more time. Okay. Don't need to guess. Notice where he quotes from. John quotes Isaiah 6.10. He had blinded their eyes and hardened their heart that they should not see with their eyes nor understand with their heart and be converted and I should heal them. These things said Esaias. These things said Esaias where? Verse 40. The things that I just quoted are things that Esaias, Isaiah said when he saw his glory and spake of him. Notice he quotes Isaiah 6.10. And after he quotes Isaiah 6.10, John then says, Isaiah said these things that I just quoted. Quoted where? In the immediate context, what I just quoted in John 12, 40. Isaiah said those words in John 12, 40, which is a quotation of Isaiah 6, 10, when he saw the glory of Jesus and spoke of him. Now let's go to Isaiah 6, 10. Isaiah 6, 10. Let's see where John 12, 40 is citing from what passage is John 12 40 quoting Isaiah 6 10. You're welcome, Jamal. Lord bless you. Before the rapture, I don't know what happened. We leave Protestant behind, then we gotta, you know. Isaiah 6 10. Here's where he's quoting from, folks, in John 12 40. Make the heart of this people fat and make their ears heavy and shut their eyes. Lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and convert and be healed. This is what he just quoted in John 12, 40. Okay, follow me. John in John 12, 40 quoted Isaiah 6, 10. And he says, Isaiah said these words because here is where he saw the glory of Jesus and spoke of him. But wait, let's see whose glory Isaiah saw in Isaiah 6. Let's read Isaiah 6, verses 1 to 5. Isaiah 6, verses 1 to 5. Okay, in the year the king Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, Adonai in Hebrew, high and lifted up, and his train filled with the temple. Above it stood the seraphim. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, and with twain, with two he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is Jehovah of hosts. Yahovah of hosts, the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes, my own physical eyes, have seen the king, Jehovah of hosts. 
Wow. Here is Isaiah seeing the glory of Jehovah with his own eyes and speaking of him. This is where Isaiah sees the glory of Jehovah and speaks of the glory that he saw. Everyone get it so far? Now read Isaiah 6, 8 to 10. Isaiah 6, 8 to 10. Let's read it. Let's read Isaiah 6, 8 to 10. Also I heard the voice of the Lord <whistles> saying, the voice of the Lord. Come on now. Listen and pay attention. The voice of the Lord. Oh, my goodness. Hold on. Yellow. Hello? Hello? Yes. Yeah. Oh. You got it. Okay, I'll see. I'll see that. Bye-bye. Oh, sorry about that. See, live streams, you're going to get distracted. It was my brother. I had to pick it up. I'm in his house. I'm his guest. Okay. All right. And also I heard verse 8, the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Okay. Park it there, folks. The voice of the Lord spoke. I heard the voice speaking. And the voice of the Lord that spoke said, said whom shall I, the voice send, who will go for us? The I and the, R, the us? What? What are you talking about, Isaiah? What are you talking about, Isaiah? What do you mean? The voice of the Lord spoke. You heard the voice speaking, the voice speaking, and saying, whom shall I send who will go for us? How does the I become the us and the us become the I? How does the I become the us and the us become the I? What are you saying, Isaiah? What are you doing here? Now let's read 9 and 10. And he, the voice of the Lord said, that's who's speaking in verse 8, go and tell this people, hear ye indeed, but understand not. And see ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of the, this people fat and make their ears heavy and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and convert and be healed. Okay, let me ask you a question. In Isaiah 6, Isaiah sees Jehovah in visible form. Appealing in, appearing in visible form on a throne whose glory fills the earth. And he says, my eyes have seen the king, Jehovah of hosts. Then he hears from the throne the voice of the Lord, the voice saying, whom shall I send who will go for us? And this is the place where Isaiah says, Jehovah commissions him to say, make the hearts of this people fat and make their ears heavy. Shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and convert and be healed. Isaiah 6.10 is quoted in John 12.40. Right after quoting this in John 12.41, John says, Isaiah said these things because that's when he saw the glory of Jesus and spoke of him. Okay, hold on, I'm confused, John. John... According to Isaiah, it is Jehovah whose glory he saw. Jehovah whose glory he saw. Yeah. But you're telling me when he saw the glory of Jehovah, he was actually seeing Jesus in his glory. Yes. Okay, I'm confused, John. He saw Jehovah. You're saying he saw Jesus. What are you trying to tell me, John? Don't you get it? Jesus is Jehovah, whose glory Isaiah saw. You're telling me that he saw Jehovah in Isaiah 6? Yes. And you're telling me that Jehovah is Jesus? Yes. The Jehovah he saw is Jesus. Hmm. Isaiah 6, 1 and 6, 5. One more time. Isaiah 6, 1 and Isaiah 6, 5. One more time. Oh, it's going to get stronger and irrefutable when I bring in the Greek. Oh, wait. Eee, this is nothing yet. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and a train filled the temple. I saw Adonai. Now notice verse 5. Then said I, woe is me, for I am undone, 
because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the king, Jehovah of hosts. Wait, Isaiah. Your own physical eyes saw Jehovah in visible form, in visible shape. Jehovah of hosts, Adonai himself, the king. Yes. Folks, understand what this means. This means that Jehovah God appeared in human form, in human shape, in human manifestation, assumed a visible shape, a physical form that must have been small enough to sit on a throne. In other words, whatever shape and form Jehovah assumed, it had to be small enough to be seated on a throne. So the throne had to be bigger than the shape that Jehovah assumed. Sinking in? Sinking in? Making sense before I move on? So I want to make sure you're getting it. Someone's confused, let me know. So I want to help you by the grace of God. Okay, so if you're getting it, now let's look at Isaiah 6 3. Thank the Lord Jesus, Robbie Stones. Keep praying for me and my angels. Isaiah 6 3. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is Jehovah of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Here's the reference to his glory. I saw Jehovah. I saw Adonai. I saw the king, Jehovah of hosts, with my own physical eyes. I saw him in a visible shape, in a visible form, on a throne. And the earth was full of his glory. So, but wait, let's go to John 12, 41. Let's look at John 12, 41 again. This is the only place in the book of Isaiah. Thank you, Chanson. In Jesus' name, great things await me and my daughters this year for the glory of Jesus, to set me free, to, to serve him in freedom by the power of the Holy Spirit. These things said Esaias when he saw his glory and spake of him. In this context, he's talking about Jesus. John, whose glory did Isaiah see in Isaiah 6? Jesus. Isaiah, whose glory did you see? Who are you talking about? Whose glory did you see that you're talking about? Jehovah of hosts. But wait, Isaiah. John is telling me that Jehovah of hosts, whose glory you saw, who you're talking about, Isaiah 6, is Jesus. Yes, he's right. So I'm going slow so it can sink in. Because you want to, you want to talk about irrefutable? You're now going to see how irrefutable this exegesis is when you look at the Greek and the Aramaic translations of Isaiah 6, which is all in my article. Let me give you the link again. Here it is. Okay. Are you now ready to be blown away? Because remember, John wrote this in Greek, right? John is writing to Greek speakers who read the Bible in Greek. That means John would be citing from the Greek version of the Old Testament, meaning, pay attention, <clears throat> since John's gospel is in Greek, that means the audience he's writing to read and write and speak Greek, which means that his audience would be reading the Old Testament in Greek. They'd be reading the Greek translation of Isaiah, right? Right? So I want to make sure you're following my logic here. It's like if I'm writing to you in English, I'm going to quote an English translation of Isaiah, right? But if I'm writing to you in Greek, I'm going to quote the Greek translation of Isaiah. And if in Russian, you get the point. Okay, so he's writing in Greek. Uh-huh. Now let's see if the Greek makes it irrefutable. Here's the Greek, folks. Here's the Greek. This is all in my article. Yep, that's why they differ, Happy Cider. He's, he's quoting a different form of the Hebrew. Yeah, that's why they differ. He's quoting a different form of the Hebrew. I'm buffering. Hold on. All right. Sorry, I'm buffering. So he's quoting a different form of the Hebrew. Okay, you don't need to know Greek to follow the argument. Isaiah said this when he saw his glory. The word saw is Aiden. His glory, glory is ten, ten, doxan, or doxin, autu. Aiden, ten, 
Doxan Autu. I'm giving the Erasmus pronunciation of the Greek and spoke of him. Okay. Again, take a moment to read the Greek transliteration, the translation of the Greek. He saw his glory. He saw is the word Iden, E-I-D-E-N, transliterated. Glory is Tain Doxan. Tain Doxan. Autu means of him. Okay, do you see the phrase? Aiden, Tain, Doxan, Autu. And here he's giving you the whole Greek. Tauta, Ipen, Isaias, Hati, Aiden, Tain, Doxan, Autu, Kai, K, Ilelesen, Peri, Autu. All right. Now, let me post it again because now I'm going to give you the Greek version, the English translation of the Greek version. This is the English translation of the Greek version. Let's see if you catch it. Isaiah 6.1 in the Greek. And it came to pass in the year in, the year in which King Uzziah died that I saw the Lord. Idon. That's first person. Same Greek word. Idon. Ton Kurion. Sitting on a high and exalted throne. And the house was full of his glory. Tais doxes autu. The same Greek. Let it sink in. Yeah, if you quote the whole Greek, they're not going to get it first and last. Unless they read Greek. That's why I'm giving the English with the Greek. Notice both John 12.41 and Isaiah 6.1 in the Greek use a form of horao to see Aiden. One is first person, I saw. The other second person he saw, right? Both use the same Greek words for glory. One is in the accusative, right? Tain, doxan. The other is genitive, right? Tais, doxes, autu. Did you catch it? Let me post it now back to back. As the Holy Spirit guides me, to make this very simple for all of you to get it. Just look at the translation of the Greek in Isaiah 6.1 and John 12.41. Do you see it's the same? And it came to pass in the year in which King Uzziah died that I saw the Lord. I saw is Aiden, first person of Orao. Now, notice it says, the, and the house was full of his glory. Tais doxes autu. These are all the same Greek words. They're the same Greek words. Now notice John 12, 41. Isaiah said this when he saw his glory. Aiden, Tain, Doxan, Autu. Do you see the Greek is identical? Is everyone getting it? Before I move on? Do you see the Greek reader of John, the Greek reader of John, who reads Isaiah in Greek, would see the connection between Isaiah 6 and John 12, 41, and would have no doubt that John is saying that Jehovah, whom Isaiah saw, whose glory he beheld, was none other than Jesus Christ before he became man. It is irrefutable in the Greek. There's no way around this in the Greek because nowhere else in Isaiah do you find this exact wording. This exact wording of John 12, 41 is only found in the Greek of Isaiah 6. Everyone got it? Who's getting confused here? So a Greek reader of John 12, 41, who's been reading Isaiah in Greek, would say, wow, this is Isaiah 6. Isaiah 6 says, Isaiah saw, I saw, Aiden, right? That's first person, the Lord, Tan Kurian, and the whole house was full of his glory. Tais, doxes, autu. John 12, 41, he saw, right? Aiden. It's the same word, but it's second person. 
He saw, second person, I saw, first person, same Greek phrase. One is an accusative, John 12, 41. Tain, doxen, doxen, autu. The other is genitive. Taste, it's the same Greek. Anyone who speaks Greek, read Greeks, can confirm. It's the same Greek. You get it? So those who are honest to God, honest to Scripture, and allow God to be who he is, can't get around this. No, sort of the truth. See, there you go again, sort of the truth. Yeah, Sort of the truth. For that, you're probably going to get banned. I just spent several sessions in the past months proving God the Father can be seen. How dare you say he can't be seen and hasn't been seen? Are you really following me, sort of the truth, or are you wasting my time and yours? I'm going to show you a place where God the Father was seen. And so I don't know if this is really too much for you. You're not able to handle this. How long have you been listening to me, sort of the truth? Before I move on. Sorry, guys. If I see someone's been with me for a while, let's see. Okay. Who told you God the Father can't be seen? Daniel 7, 9 to 10. Daniel sees the God the Father as the Ancient of Days. Revelation chapter 4 and 5. John sees God the Father in visible form on the throne, distinct from the Lamb who's Jesus. Can you stop pontificating and say it makes sense because God the Father can't be seen? I'm going to throw you in the lion's den. And have you deal with anti-Trinitarians so they can tear you to shreds for not picking up and learning how to argue and how not to argue. Your position. I don't want to start the new year angry. Please help me. Please. Okay, everyone else, did you get the point? Okay, start of the truth. After I answer this question, I'm going to block you. I'm sorry. Because Jesus as God is invisible. The Holy Spirit as God is invisible. God by nature is invisible. David Wood needs to be invisible because with that kind of face, he's going to make everyone repent and run for the hills. And ask God why such a hideous, ugly creature exists on this planet. Okay. Jesus as God is invisible. The Holy Spirit as God is invisible. The Father as God is invisible. God by nature is invisible. If the Father doesn't appear visibly, if Jesus doesn't appear visibly, Holy Spirit doesn't appear visibly, you cannot see them. Now, we are praying that David Wood will be invisible because such a hideous, ugly face. If ugliness was a sin, this man would be in the pit of hell, the lowest pit of hell, because his ugliness makes people cringe and ask God why such hideous-looking creatures exist in this world. How can something so ugly be created by something so beautiful? Right? Now, with that said, so we don't lose the point because people think they know the scripture and pontificate, right? Happy Cider. Do you hear what this guy says about me on his live streams? Even when he's Israel, he managed to take a shot about my YouTube channel. So it's eye for an eye, tit for tat. He takes my eye, I take his eyes and his nose, right? I go above and beyond the, the punishment. Okay, now let's focus, sort of truth. Please, let's focus. Okay. Let's not forget the point. Does everyone see? Does everyone see? Right? Don't ever insult Scarface again, Andrew Martin, because I'll block you for that. Does everyone see that the Greek reader of John 12, 41, who's familiar with the Greek of Isaiah 6, would make the connection? Right? Let me post it again. You better believe it. That's all I can do is get personal and attack ad hominems. Let's quote it again. Let's not lose the point because people don't focus and study and learn, pretend they're listening, wasting their time and mine. Okay, let's read. Here is the Greek of John 1241 and the Greek of Isaiah. 
John's Greek readers would be reading Isaiah in Greek, and the connection to them would be irrefutable, clear as day. Even a blind man could see it. Okay? Okay? Even a blind man could see it. Okay, let's read. Watch. Isaiah said this when he saw his glory. Iden, ten, ten, doxan, autu. Okay? And spoke of him. In the context, it's Jesus. Read Isaiah 6, 1 from the Greek. And it came to pass in the year in which King Uzziah died that I saw the Lord. Iden, same Greek word for saw. One is first person. Isaiah 6, the other one, John 12, is second person. I saw, he saw, but it's the same Greek word. I saw the Lord, Aidenton Kurian, sitting on a high and exalted throne, and the house was full of his glory. Of his glory, teis doxes autu, Erasmian pronunciation. Any Greek reader will tell you that's identical. It's the same Greek. John 12, 41, the Greek is identical to the Greek of, John, of Isaiah 6, 1. For you Greek speakers and readers here, am I lying? It's identical. It's just one is first person, the other second person. One is the genitive, the other is the accusative. But it's the same Greek. See, first last reads Greek. So my question to every one of you, my question to every one of you, a Greek reader of John 1241, who reads Isaiah in Greek, are you telling me that Greek reader would not see the deliberate connection to Isaiah 6 right after John quotes Isaiah 6.10, where in the Greek of Isaiah 6, it speaks of Isaiah seeing Jehovah with his own eyes and seeing his glory fill the temple and fill the earth, that the Greek reader would not see the connection between Isaiah 6, where Jehovah appears to Isaiah, Isaiah sees his glory with what John says about Isaiah seeing the glory of Jesus. Yeah, you can you can find it. You can go to BibleHub.com. So now let's continue reading. The Greek version of Isaiah 6. This Now let's look at verse 3. Verse 3. Verse 3. Follow with me. Follow with me. And one cried to the other, and they said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Teis, doxes, autu. The Greek is the same. I'm going to repeat this like a broken record. Until it sinks in by the power of the Holy Spirit. Because I want you to learn these arguments. Understand these arguments. Absorb them. Share them. For King Jesus is worthy. We proclaim he is Jehovah in the flesh. Right? Okay. Now watch here. Compare. Okay. Let's put Isaiah 6.1. Isaiah 6.3. And John 12.41. Back to back. Compare. Tell me. The Greek reader of John would not see the connection. And let me repeat. These words only appear in Isaiah 6. They don't appear anywhere else. Iden doesn't appear anywhere else in reference to what John is saying. In reference to what John is saying, these words don't appear anywhere else. Taste, doxase, autu, tain, doxane, out. Only appears in Isaiah 6. It does not appear in Isaiah 52, 13 and 15. Does not appear in Isaiah 53. Does not appear anywhere else but Isaiah 6 in reference to what John says about Isaiah seeing and speaking about the Messiah's glory. Nowhere else. This form of the Greek does not appear in Isaiah 52, 13 and 15 or Isaiah 53. Contrary to what anti-Trinitarians, Arian heretics like Greg Stafford want you to believe. It does not appear. The form of the Greek used in John 12 only appears in Isaiah 6. Clear? Is it sinking in, folks? I got to make sure it's sinking in before I move on. But you still haven't been blown away. Now, let me show you how the Aramaic translates Isaiah 6. The Aramaic 
translates Isaiah 6. The Aramaic translations of the Old Testament are known as targumim, targums. These are Aramaic paraphrases of the Old Testament done by Jews. You still haven't seen nothing yet. Here's the link to the English translation. Here's the link to the English translation of Isaiah in Aramaic. The English translation of the Aramaic paraphrase of Isaiah 6. Guys, are you ready to be blown away? You ready to be blown away? Who's ready? Follow my article. Make sure you go read the article and share and use it. Who's ready? You sure you're ready? Uh, I don't think you are. Hold on. Let's see. Okay. Read. In the year in which King Uzziah was smitten with leprosy, the prophet said, I saw the glory of the Lord sitting upon his throne. End of story. Ding, 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 ding. High and lifted up into the highest heavens, and the temple is filled with the brightness of his glory. In the Aramaic of Isaiah 6, 1, it has Isaiah saying, I saw the glory of the Lord. Ding, 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 ding. Game over. Knockout. I don't think it's some kid, man. Let me let me quote it again. It's all my article. Watch here. Let's try it again. Okay. In the year in which King Uzziah was smitten with the leprosy, the prophet said, I saw the glory of the Lord sitting upon his throne high and lifted up into the heavens, and the temple is filled with the brightness of his glory. <whistles> so you're telling me a Jew who read Isaiah and Greek or read Isaiah and Aramaic would not make the connection between John saying Isaiah saw Jesus' glory and Isaiah 6, where Jehovah appeared visibly, whose glory Isaiah beheld. He would not connect Jesus with that Jehovah God that appeared to Isaiah. Is that what you're trying to convince me? A Greek reader of Isaiah and a Jew reading Isaiah and the Aramaic would not see that John is telling us Jesus is that Jehovah God Almighty that appeared on the throne whose glory Isaiah saw with his eyes. That was Jesus. Really? You want to convince me? Do you see how desperate, how wickedly blasphemous these anti-Trinitarians are? Not allowing Jesus to be who he is, allow, not allowing the Bible to speak clearly. Before I move on, I want to get some feedback. Are you with me? You're getting it? Is it making sense? Who's not getting it? Just help me help it up, you guys. Just want to make sure you're getting it. Who's not getting it? I hope this is not boring, you guys. I hope this is like showing you the irrefutable proof that God is triune, that Jesus is God Almighty in the flesh, distinct from the Father and Spirit, one with them in essence, glory, power, and majesty. Yes, that's what I just said, medic. Brother, please pay attention. And if you're playing video games, you know you're going to be in trouble, right? Please pay attention for the glory of Christ. Not for me, for the glory of Christ. Pay attention. This is the Aramaic paraphrase of Isaiah called the Targum done by Jews. Thank you, Hapsider. So much better than using Philippians 2. Exactly, man. Okay. All right. Did you get that part so far? Because I feel like you guys are bored, man. I feel like, man, you guys are not really getting into it. And then let's quote the rest of it. Isaiah 6.5. Are you ready for Isaiah 6.5? Aramaic paraphrase. I love that, Anna. In Jesus' almighty name, by the almighty spirit, 
May the Triune God use this to bring the entire Jewish population to Jesus, their God in the flesh. Hey guys, here is Isaiah 6, 5 from the Aramaic paraphrase of Isaiah. You guys ready? You guys ready? Because I want to go out with a bang. Last session of the year. And I'm not going to see you till next year. You guys ready? You excited? I'm getting excited for you. It's like you guys are falling asleep. <laughs> but if it's David Wood, you'd be awake, huh? Hmm? All right. Oh, my goodness. My goodness. All right. Hold on. Sanchez. Yes. Hold on. Okay, guys, I'm going to have to entertain you for, I'm going to have to hold it because this is what it is, live stream, someone's at the door. Hold on, I'm going to entertain you for a minute. Okay? Hold on, let me entertain you. There. Okay, hold on. Sorry, because I got to open the door. Uh, shut up! Come on! Move it! Sorry, it's like these darn commercials. I'll be right back. Sorry, guys. I had to open the door. All right. You ready? I don't think you guys are ready. Left you in suspense. I left you in suspense. Yeah, I'll put that next, Kung Fu Fighting. I left you in suspense. Are you ready? Isaiah 6 5 in the Aramaic. I love you guys. You ready? Come on. Come on. Then said, I woe is me, for I have sinned, for I'm a guilty man to reprove. And I dwell in the midst of a people polluted with sin. Bam, bam, bam. For mine eyes have seen the glory of the Shekinah, Shekinah of the King of the world, the Lord of hosts. <whistles> ah. The word Shekinah, Shekinah, many scholars believe comes from Shekan, right? From which we get the word Mishkan, which means, you know, the, the dwelling of God, the dwelling place of God. For mine eyes have seen the glory of the Shekinah of the King of the world, the Lord of hosts. Ah, ha, ha, ha. Did you get it? Now, let me ask you again. A Jew reading Isaiah and Greek or Aramaic and sees this. You're telling me if they read John 12 and saw that John connects the Lord Jesus Christ with Isaiah 53 and with Isaiah 6, Isaiah's temple vision, would not assume and not conclude that John is saying Jesus is that Jehovah God Almighty that Isaiah saw, whose glory he beheld. That's what you're trying to convince me? That's what you're trying to convince me? Walter Jesus, I'm going to show you how you can use Isaiah 6 to decimate modalism as a wicked satanic heresy. Are you ready? I'm going to show you how you can use the Aramaic paraphrase of Isaiah to prove 
So wait, sort of truth. Yeah, you're going to get blocked right now. You mean the Jewish believers like John wouldn't read the Gospel of John? So there weren't Jewish believers that were reading the Gospel of John because John only converted Gentiles. And Michael Brown is a Jew who doesn't read the Gospel of John. You see what you did again, sort of truth? You again made a comment that is false. So Jews don't believe in Jesus. So Michael Brown is a Jew who doesn't believe in Jesus, so he doesn't read the Gospel of John. Tovia Singer, who's an anti-Christian rabbi, doesn't read the New Testament to try to destroy the Christian faith. At the time of John, there weren't Jews who believed in Jesus and were not, yes. I don't know what's happening today, sort of truth. I do love you as a brother in Christ, but I don't know what's happening with you today. What's going on with you today, brother? Are you really paying attention? Are you really paying attention, brother? What's going on today? So John the Jew wrote the Gospel of John. Jesus' first followers were Jews. There were Jewish believers in Jesus, even among the Pharisees. But you say Jews don't read John. Okay, here you go again. For mine eyes have seen the glory of the Shekinah, Shekinah of the King of the world, the Lord of hosts. Okay, let me again repeat my question. Let me repeat my question. You're telling me a Jew who reads Isaiah in Greek or Aramaic would not see that John in John 12, 36 to 42 specifically, in verse 41, is identifying Jesus as that Jehovah God Almighty that Isaiah beheld, whose glory he saw in Isaiah 6. Is that what you're trying to convince me? Really? Now, for Walter Jesus, do you know how the Aramaic paraphrase destroys modalism, shows it's a satanic heresy? You want to know how it does it? Let me show you how. You ready now for me to show you? Walter, here you go. This is the same Aramaic. Aramaic. This is Isaiah 6, 8. And I heard the voice of the word of the Lord. Wow. It was the word of the Lord that commissioned Isaiah, who said, Whom shall I send to prophesy? And who will go to teach? Then said I, here am I, send me. Wait, the Jews knew that the word of the Lord was there on the throne with the Lord. And it was the word of the Lord speaking, whose voice Isaiah heard. <whistles> Sink it in or no? Sink it in before anyone asks me anything. So here's my question. Here are Jews who are not Christian. And yet they, are, they realize from the Old Testament, there is this entity, this messenger, this agent of God, distinct from God, whom they called the Memra in Aramaic. Logos in Greek. Philo Alexandria called them Logos. The Word. Distinct from God, right? Sent by God, God's agent who speaks on behalf of God, who's there on the throne with God, who speaks and commissions prophets. So that means the Jews, from their reading of the Old Testament, already discovered the multi-personal nature of God. And one of those divine persons is called the Word. So John didn't introduce anything new when he said, in the beginning, there was the Word who was with God, who is God, who created all things. The only new thing that John added is that that word has now become the flesh and blood human being called Jesus. That's the only new thing he added. I have no idea what you're asking me, Sammy. Yes, Hapsider. It is Jesus as the word who's commissioning Isaiah on behalf of the us, the Father and the Spirit. Yes, 
That's what you're supposed to see in light of the New Testament. Here it is. And this is all in my article again. Let me give you a link to my article. That's why, guys, please pray God will sanctify me to become more like Jesus in holiness and purity and in love and obedience and worship, more loving, compassionate, more bold, uncompromising, never pervert the scriptures, to provide for me and my daughters and to give me wisdom to keep teaching you this because this is wisdom God has given me to give to you. This is wisdom that the Spirit wants us, the body, to have, to walk in this truth, to live this truth, to love this truth, to proclaim this truth and die for this truth. Sammy, take a break, brother. Take a break. Take a short break, brother. Because I'm already answering your questions, but you're not listening, bro. One thing, guys, please help me to help you. Honestly, we all have issues. We're all imperfect. Look at David. He's the most imperfect apologist in the world, and he still gets people. Help me to help you. Don't pontificate and chime in and make a statement that may be wrong. Listen. And listen to what I'm saying carefully because you may get the answers to what I'm saying before you ask. Because as I answer something and then you ask something already answered, I'm wondering, are you listening? And that causes me to stumble. I don't want you to waste your time. You can do other things with your time. I want to bless you, but bless me to bless you. Otherwise, you're not learning this material. If you're not learning this material, you can't use it. And if you can't use it, then why are you listening? The point of learning is to know your faith, to know the Bible, to know God more intimately, to love him more passionately, and then to share it. It's not to be entertained. Right? You can watch a movie if you want to get entertained. David Clifford, I'll be honest and frank with you. I don't believe you're human. I believe you're a filthy rabid dog. So, so much for beliefs. Right? With me there? Let's not lose the point. Here's Isaiah 6, 8 again. Jews translating the Aramaic, the, the Hebrew into Aramaic. Look what the Jews said. Look what the Jews said. Here you go. That's the article. Let me quote Isaiah 6, 8 again. Hold on, man. I'm trying to get that. In Jesus' name, Father, Son, and Spirit, be glorified and anoint us. In Jesus' name, here. Let me do this again. Here. Let's get it. Guide us, Holy Spirit. Isaiah 6, 8 from the Aramaic. And I heard the voice of the word of the Lord. I heard the voice of the word of the Lord which said, whom shall I send to prophesy and who will go to teach? Then said I, here am I, send me. Now, do me a favor, Protestant post Isaiah 6, 8 from the King James. And let's compare. Okay. Notice the King James. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord. I heard the voice of the Lord. Right? Saying. So the voice of God speaks. God's voice is a person who speaks. And you can hear the voice speaking. I heard the voice speaking. It's not simply the Lord's voice. It's someone called the voice of the Lord. Someone who's known as God's voice who speaks on God's behalf. It's not simply God speaking. It's someone called the voice who's speaking. This voice belongs to the Lord. This voice speaks for the Lord. This voice is a person who can speak. That's what it's saying. How do I know it's saying that? Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? How do I know the voice is not simply God speaking, but someone, some person, some entity in heaven with God who's called God's voice because he's the one who speaks on God's behalf? Because even the Jews saw it. Here you go. And I heard the voice of the word of the Lord. So even the Jews saw that the voice of the Lord is not simply God speaking audibly. The voice of the Lord is his word, who's a distinct person, who speaks on his behalf, who represents God and commissions 
the prophets. Here you go. And I heard the voice of the word of the Lord, which said, Whom shall I send to prophesy, and who will go to teach? Then said I, Here am I, send me. Now the singular and plural of Isaiah 6, 8 makes sense. Now it makes sense. Because notice what it said in Isaiah 6, 8. It said, And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send who will go for us? Now it makes sense why the voice could say, Who will go for us? Because the voice is speaking on behalf of the Lord, whom he represents and speaks for, and the Spirit. You with me there, or did I lose you guys, and you're getting bored with this, and you're saying, hey, let's shut down, it's too much. Is that making sense? Now, hold on. I said, when Isaiah 6 said, says, the voice says, whom shall I send who go for us? That's because the voice is now speaking on behalf of the Godhead. He's saying us, meaning I, the voice, Jehovah, and the Spirit. The us means the voice, Jehovah, and the Spirit in union. How do I know that he's speaking on behalf of the Spirit as well? Let me show you how I know. Let's read Isaiah 6, 8 to 10. Exactly, Riaz. You connect this with Genesis 1.26. Let me connect it with Genesis 1.26. Okay. Isaiah 6, 8 to 10. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Then said I, Here am I, send me. Here am I, send me. And he said, Pay attention now to 9 and 10. Please pay attention 9 and 10, or you're not going to get it. And he said, Go and tell this people, Hear ye indeed, but understand not. See ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat, and make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear. Sorry, start buffering. Lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and convert and be healed. Okay, don't forget what you read in Isaiah 6, 9 and 10. Don't forget. Let's go to, oh, yeah, in Jesus' name, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, be glorified. In Jesus' name, save us. Okay, let's, let's, don't forget what you read in Isaiah 6, 9 and 10. Now let's go to Acts 28, 25 to 27. Acts 28, 25 to 27. I mentioned this in the past. I'm going to repeat it again. Sort of truth. I, heard, I hope you're still there and you're trucking. Sometimes you have to be tough in love and disciplined in love to sharpen you and shaken you and waken you. Right? Acts 28, 25 to 27. And when they agreed, not among themselves. Pay attention now what Paul quotes. When they agreed, not among themselves, they departed. After that, Paul had spoken one word. Well spake the Holy Ghost, well spake the Holy Spirit by Esaias the prophet unto our fathers, saying, well did the Holy Spirit speak by Isaiah when he said, go unto this people and say, hearing ye shall hear and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see and not perceive. For the heart of this people is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have they closed, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart, and she be, should be converted. I should heal them. Whoa. Whoa. Paul just quoted Isaiah 6, 9 to 10 and said, those are the words that the Holy Spirit spoke to Isaiah to speak to our fathers. Paul said, the Holy Spirit said those words. In Isaiah 6, 9 to 10. I don't think you got it. Paul just said, Isaiah 6, 9 to 10 are the words that the Holy Spirit said through Isaiah to the prophets. Sammy, if I have to explain Holy Ghost, you are, you're out of here. You don't know who the Holy Ghost is? Okay. Did you see Acts 28, 25? Sammy, I'm thinking you're not going to last long here. I'm just thinking. I'm sensing. There's something about you that you just don't see it and 
you know, just it's I'm, I'm, I'm prophesying by next year, you'll be gone. I'm thinking, God forbid, I want sincere, serious people, but something about you. There's something about you. And usually I, I sense something about people and I'm sensing something about you. Right. Right. Acts 28, 25 to 27. Let's post it again. No, folks, seriously. Sometimes there's something I sense. It's not a feeling about people, and I turn out to be right. right. Acts 28, 25 to 27. There's something about this guy that doesn't click well with me. Acts 28, 25 to 27. And when they agreed not among themselves, they departed. After that, Paul had spoken one word. Well spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah the prophet unto her father, saying, Go unto this people. According to Paul, who said the words of Isaiah 6, 9 to 10? Who gave Isaiah those words to give to Israel? You just read it here. Okay, now you guys confuse me. Here it says the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost. But in John 12, it's Jesus Christ. It's Jesus Christ. You understand now why the plural, Isaiah 6, 8? Whom shall I send who will go for us? Because the voice of the Lord, that's two, voice of the Lord, two, and the Spirit were there. So the entire Godhead was there commissioning Isaiah. Now, does that mean when he saw Jehovah, he saw all three persons? Perhaps. That the visible appearance was the visible appearance of the You finally see? You finally see it? All righty then. How do I answer my friend, Hapsider, when I just said that he said, and us? How can this be a modalistic text when, according to modalism, there is no us because it's a single person and the manifestations occur at different times? Yeah. I don't know if I'm going to keep buffering. How do I ex ex answer Hapsider, who says, can modalists use this when the us is referring to three persons that are there, whereas modalism doesn't believe in three manifestations appearing simultaneously? If they do, that means they're desperate. But clearly, I just show that one of them is the voice of the Lord, so he is the voice distinct from the Lord, and still it's a manifestation. Yeah, I think I'm going to be giving up next year. So you seriously think this is a modalistic proof text where the voice of the Lord is distinct from the Lord and says I and us, but that's modalism. Yes, I see now. I see. I see, said the blind man. Hapsider, you you think there isn't an argument that a person can't turn around? Why are you worried about them turning it around? Can you show me one argument that a person cannot turn it around, turn around and deny? Hapsider, answer the question. Is there an argument that you bring up that they cannot turn around? Yeah. Yeah. Happy New Year to you too. Glory to Christ. Is there an argument that they can't turn around? Is there an argument that you bring up that a person cannot turn around, whether anti-Trinitarians like modalists or Muslims or rabbis? 
So you, are you serious that you're th telling me, yeah, you know, they may turn around? Of course they're going to turn around. You're insulting my intelligence. Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. Guys, I, do you want me to continue? Because I think I'm losing you guys, man. I really am. I think I'm losing most of you guys. I don't think you're following me. I think this was kind of too much, and maybe I went into a topic that was too deep. Maybe I should have just held off. You know, because I don't know how much clear I can make this. I'm trying to make it as clear as I can, to be honest with you. I uh, know, Walter Jesus, John 16, 13, 15 won't convince them either. So you guys are not listening. Any passage you use, they have an explanation to get around it. Are you guys living in Fantasy Island? I mean, do you live in some planet where you actually think they haven't heard of John 16, 13, or 15? They haven't heard of John 14, 16, and 17. You seriously think they are not aware of these arguments and have responses to them? You guys really live are living in a bubble. You're not doing evangelism. You guys haven't heard my debates then with the one is heretic, where everything I brought up, he had a response to. Does that mean his response was solid? No. Was it based on truth? No. Was it factual? No. But he still had a response. So if you guys are naive and you live in a bubble, maybe you live in planet Venus and think that people don't have responses to your arguments, then you're not evangelizing. You haven't done evangelism. Honestly, you haven't. You have not gone out and preached and witnessed to the lost or engaged other people of various viewpoints. You've been sitting home, listening to sermons, and done nothing with this information. Because you really think, you really think they don't know about Isaiah and John 12? Buffering real badly, so I don't know what I'm going to do. Call me an ambulance. Bra, is that the same guy, bra? I'll come here under a different nick. Isaiah 9 6 is their favorite proof text, I am legend, to prove that Jesus is God the Father. See, that tells me you guys are not evangelizing. If you guys are evangelizing and witnessing, you would encounter modalists, Mormons, Joe's Witnesses, Muslims, and you would see what their arguments are. No, they already have responses to everything you throw at them. Yeah. Happy Cider is not going to be too happy. He keeps it up. Right. Is it okay now? Is it buffering or is it okay? Happy, happy, joy, joy, happy, happy, joy. Okay, guys, what do you want me to do? Because, you know, actually, yeah, this this uh, interaction kind of shut me down. I don't even know if I can continue because it just, it's it's frustrating. I don't know. Sometimes either I'm not clear or you guys are not getting it. All right. How about now? No, I don't think you guys are getting it, honestly. I mean, I don't know. Did you get the point so far? Did you get this point? We've already been over an hour, right? And I tried to show from the Greek and Aramaic that John is saying that the Jehovah that Isaiah saw definitely is Jesus. But the same New Testament says all three persons of the Godhead were present. So... Paul says the Holy Spirit was there, and he spoke through Isaiah to the fathers. So according to the New Testament, according to the New Testament, the Trinity was there in Isaiah 6, in that vision, appearing to Isaiah. So when Isaiah saw Jehovah in visible form, was that a manifestation, a visible manifestation of the Godhead, Father, Son, Holy Spirit? Most likely. Or was it a manifestation of Jesus, who was there? Okay. So what I was trying to say, if it keeps buffering, I'm going to just shut down. What I was trying to say is, does that mean the visible form that Isaiah saw, was that the Godhead appearing visibly as one? That Jehovah God, was it all three persons appearing visibly? Possibly. Or was it the word of God, Jesus, appearing visibly and speaking on behalf of the Father and the Spirit who were there but didn't appear visibly? You get my point?
Either interpretation is valid. It can be the Godhead appearing visibly. Or it can be Jesus appearing visibly and speaking on behalf of the Godhead who were there but invisible. Either interpretation would be valid because the New Testament says Jesus was there and the Spirit was there. Paul says in Acts 28, that was the Spirit who said the words of Isaiah 6, 9 to 10. John says that was Jesus who was there on the throne. Right? So if you really were listening and following me and not playing games, then did you see that if you look at John 12 carefully and look at the various versions of Isaiah 6 carefully, that it is irrefutable. You cannot refute if you're honest to God, honest to Scripture, and not demonized to pervert Scripture to your shame and destruction, that the Greek of Isaiah, the American of Isaiah, make it irrefutably clear that John is saying Isaiah did see Jesus appearing visibly as Jehovah God Almighty on the throne whose glory Isaiah saw. At least you got that from this one-hour discussion. Did you get it? And did you then get that in Acts 28, 25, 27, Paul quotes Isaiah 6, 9 to 10 and says, those words were uttered by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit said those words through Isaiah to our ancestors, attributing that commission and those words that the prophet was to speak to the Holy Spirit, meaning that Paul believed the Holy Spirit was also there, so that if you take John, Jesus was definitely there. Take Paul, the Holy Spirit was definitely there. That means the Godhead was definitely there, appearing to Isaiah, commissioning Isaiah, so that either means all three appeared as Jehovah God, as the one Jehovah God, or Jesus appeared as Jehovah God and was speaking on behalf of the Spirit and the Father, and then the Spirit entered Isaiah to empower Isaiah to say the words of Jesus. Either interpretation is valid because according to New Testament, the Trinity was there. Did you get that? In Jesus Almighty, for the glory of the triune God. Please get it in Jesus' name. Please. So I don't think that my efforts are in vain. Did you get it? So now, if you did get it, Isaiah 6, 8. Now let's see if you got it. Isaiah 6, verse 8. Let's look at it. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? If you got it, why does the voice speak in the singular I and then says us, plural? Why does he say us? Who goes for us? Why? If you got it. Let's see if you got it. Why? Please, for the glory of the child God, I pray you get it. Why the plural us, Remy? I know the word speaks. Bam. I for Christ, you made me happy. Pedro, Anna, Sargon, Remy, Protestant. Thank you. Sammy still thinks he get it. He didn't get it, though. Poor Sammy. Sammy, you're in La La Land. When you're, when, as, because you're in Venus, make sure you visit Saturn. You got it because he's speaking on behalf of the Godhead. The us is because the voice is not just speaking for himself. He's speaking to the Father and the Spirit, and the commissioning of Isaiah is on behalf of him, the Father, and the Spirit. Thank you. Praise the child God, Father, Son, and Spirit. You bless me when you get it. I mean it from my heart. I want you to get this so badly. I want you to learn this so badly and absorb it so badly and proclaim it for the glory of Jesus. Because if you don't get it, you can't use it. Right? Look at this guy, Josh. Hey, Josh, why don't you go back to India and pray for India? This guy's in, he's in another stadium. Right? You got it? All right. Glory to God. Now, just to wrap things up by going into the Aramaic again, here it goes. This is all in my article. Let me give you the link again.
That's the article. All this information is there. Let me quote that relevant part again of Isaiah 6, 8 from the Aramaic paraphrase of Isaiah. Here's the Aramaic translation of Isaiah, translated in English. And I heard the voice of the word of the Lord, which said, Whom shall I send to prophesy? Who will go to teach? Bam. Even the Jews who are not Christians, Jews who are not Christians, could read the Old Testament. And from their reading, they saw, wow, there's this voice. There's this word. That's not simply God speaking audibly, but an actual divine person, an entity, a messenger, an agent sent by God who sits with God on the throne, who commissions people who happens to be God. And they call them in Aramaic, Memra. In Hebrew, Davar. In Greek, Logos. The Jews saw this from their reading of the Old Testament, and they were not Christians. Wow! <whistles> Abdel Halaj. Correct. See, he says it. You get it? This is the Jewish translation of Isaiah in Aramaic, guys. They saw that that voice that said, Whom shall I send will go for us? Was the memra, the word distinct from God, with God, destroying modalism because the word, word is already there, active as a person. Modalism says the word of John 1 is not a person. It's God's plan. But the Jews said, no, it's not God's plan. The word is a person, an actual person who speaks to God, whom God speaks to, destroying modalism as a satanic heresy. And that word was the one who commissioned Isaiah. Davar Yahovah. Memra Maran. Memra Mar. Logos Theu. Everyone got it? Uh, but it gets even better in the Aramaic Targums. You want to destroy modalism? Here again is another... Aramaic translation of the Old Testament. This is Targum Pseudo Jonathan. This is all of my article, folks. Targum Pseudo Jonathan. This is all in my article. Let me quote it. Okay. Here it is. Let me quote it, break it down in two. Guys, read with me. All in my article. Okay. Read with me. Be blown away. Targum Pseudo Jonathan on Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 7. You guys ready for the shock? But the custom of other nations is to carry their gods upon their shoulders, that they may seem to be nigh them, but they cannot hear with their ears, be they nigh or be they far off. But the word of the Lord sitteth upon his throne, high and lifted up, an allusion to Isaiah 6, 1, and heareth our prayer, what time we pray before him and make our petitions. Whoa! The word of the Lord is on the throne, high and lifted up. The word of the Lord hears our prayers and hears our petitions and answers them. That's what the Jews that translated Deuteronomy 4, 7 in Aramaic believed. The word of the Lord on the throne, high and lifted up, an allusion to Isaiah 6, 1. And guess what? The Aramaic paraphrase of Psalm 9.8 says something similar. Aramaic of Psalm 9, verse 8. Here's the link to the English translation. Psalm 9.8 9, in Aramaic. Notice this. These are all Aramaic paraphrases of the Hebrew Scriptures by Jews who are not Christians. Here you go. But as for the word of the Lord, his seat... In the highest heaven forever. He has established his throne for judgment. My goodness. The Aramaic paraphrase of Isaiah chapter 6. The Aramaic paraphrase of Deuteronomy 4.7. The Aramaic paraphrase of Psalm 9.8. Done by Jews or not Christians. All of which state the word of the Lord sits on the throne. High lifted up. The word of the Lord has established his throne to judge. The word of the Lord is the one who commissions prophets like Isaiah. And the word of the Lord hears our prayers and knows our petition, petitions. Hmm. 
Angela, if you use these sources, you will obliterate, decimate, annihilate this wicked satanic doctrine. Modalism, it's of the devil. And they're not your brothers and sisters in Christ until they repent. Well, you it's online, half -sider. I just gave you the links. Go to my article. I gave you the links. Jehovah Jesus Akbar. It's in my article, Angela. Just listen to this session over and over again. And here's the link to my article. Here it is again. Guys, I'm doing it for the glory of Christ to serve you for his sake. I'm doing this because I want you to know this. I want you to understand this. I want you to absorb this. I want you to memorize this. I want you to share this for the glory of the child God. Please, that's how you bless me. Listen attentively. Don't pontificate. Learn, absorb, ask the Spirit to empower you to then use it for the glory of Christ. Why do you think I'm doing this? Why do you think David does this? Why do you think any of us do it? As our love for Jesus, who tells us, if you love me, feed my sheep. Jesus says, if you love me, Sam, feed my flock. Lord, I'm trying to feed them. I'm imperfect. Sometimes I cause them to stumble. Have mercy on me, but help me to serve them for your glory. Right? You're getting it? Was this amazing or what? I wanted to go out with a bang for the last session for the for the year. This is the last session for the year. I'm not going to see you till next year. Sorry to break your hearts. You won't see me till next year. And I wanted it to be a bang. Like, wow. And Liza, are you learning? You learned two things, Liza. Die to that idol in your heart so God can have that man for you so you can marry. And you're learning the depth of Scripture, the beauty of Scripture, that Jesus is God. The Trinity is God. He is real. He is alive. And the Bible is the word of the triune God. Man, going out with a bang. Bang, bang. Let me put the icing on the cake. I got to do a part three. I'm not done. We still got a lot more from John 12. All right. Okay, now I'm going to quote this because I want to shock you guys. I'm not going to tell you where it's from. Hold on. I'm going to quote it, but I'm not going to tell you where it's from. Just wait a second. Put down the stones. Hold on. You like that song? Hold on. Let me get it. I don't want to tell you where it's from. I got a picture of you. Okay. Okay. I probably won't be able to post all of it. That's fine. I'm going to have to break it down into segments. Hold on. Be patient, folks, especially you guys listening later. There's going to be – we're going to drag. It's okay. I'm going to have to break it down in two. Okay. Okay, let's see if I can post this all of the first part verse. Let's see. Okay. If I can, I'll read it. Okay, read with me. Okay. Don't text. Read. Don't text, but read, please. Okay. Let me do this. Let's post. Read. I'm going to be shocked where this comes from. Okay. Just be patient in Jesus' name. Just read. Okay. Some of you may know because you, be, you probably have read this. Okay. Let's read together now. Now I got it. I was able to put it all in. Okay, let's read. Now read with me. For though they had disbelieved, it's not about the Egyptians and the magicians at the time of Moses. For though they had disbelieved everything because of their magic arts, yet when their firstborn were destroyed, they acknowledged your people to be God's son, God's child, Israel. For while gentle silence enveloped all things. Guys, pay attention. And night in its swift course was now half gone. Your all-powerful word, your, you, God, your all-powerful word leaped from heaven, from the royal throne. So your word is almighty, and it came down from you, from your throne, into the midst of the land that was doomed. A stern warrior. So your all-powerful word appeared on earth as a warrior, carrying the sharp sword of your authentic command. So you had a sword ready to carry out your command. 
and stood and filled all things with death. So he slew the Egyptians. And he was so huge in appearance, he touched heaven while standing on the earth. Wow. God, your all-powerful word that's on your throne came down from your throne, appeared visibly as a giant, reaching heaven, touching the earth, and he had a sword, and he slew the Egyptians at your command. Where did this come from? Where did this come from? Wisdom of Solomon. You little wicked sinner, Cruz. You had to Google it, you cheater. Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 18, verses 13 to 16. It's one of the books that Protestants and Jews don't accept the scripture, but which Catholics, Orthodox, and historians, and Coptics believe is scripture. The Wisdom of Solomon, a Jewish book written by Jews before the time of Christ, which Jews today and Protestants don't accept the scripture, but which Catholics, Roman Catholics, Orthodox, Coptics, and historians, this Church of the East, all accept as scripture, so can I ask you a question? How did this Jewish document written by Jews before Christ became flesh, before John was written, how did this Jewish author or authors know God has his all-powerful word as a distinct entity from him who sits on the throne with him, who comes down at God's command and carries out his order to destroy or save? Where did they get that from? They got it from the Old Testament. So what else do you want? The Jews who translated the Hebrew Old Testament Aramaic knew about the word of God. Distinct person from God who is God. The Jews that wrote Wisdom of Solomon knew about the word of God. That he's a distinct person from God who is God. Philo of Alexandria and an Alexandrian Jew trying to communicate the Jewish faith in Greek language to Greek philosophers. Writing at the time of Christ. Mentions logos, the very word John uses in John's gospel for the word. As distinct from God, distinct from creation, the, the second God, who is the chief of angels, the high priest who sits on the throne. Where did they get all of this from? The Old Testament. You get it? In other words, John 1 isn't telling you anything new. When it says, in the beginning there was the word of God, who is God who created all things, the only new thing he added, the only thing, a Jew to John, I'm not lying. It's just a fact of history. A Jew would have said to John, we know this, John. We know it from the Hebrew scriptures. We know in the Old Testament, there's this word distinct from God, who originates from God, who's one with God. Who okay. Okay. They would have said to John, we know all this, John. We know in the Old Testament, there's the word of God, distinct from God, who comes from God, originates from God, who is God, who appears to our ancestors, commissioned prophets, who answers our prayers, who saves and judge, judges. We all, we all know this, John. We know about the word. We know it from the Hebrew scriptures. We know this. But he goes, oh, but here's what you don't know. That word became flesh. That's the only new thing he added. Wait, wait, wait. That word became flesh? Yeah, he became a Jew. He became one of us. He became an Israelite. Born of a blessed virgin woman. Who? Jesus of Nazareth. That's the only new thing he added. Did you know that? Did you know that? So if you go back and re-listen to this session and the, the previous session, listen carefully. Ignore the distractions. Read the article. I've now given you ample, irrefutable evidence, evidence irrefutable to the honest, God-fearing Bible believer. If he's a wicked agent of Satan, he'll pervert anything. But if he fears God and is honest to Scripture, the evidence is irrefutable that in John 12, Jesus, John is saying, when Isaiah saw Jehovah appear visibly in visible shape, in visible form, on a throne, whose glory be held, that was my God and Savior Jesus appearing to him in his preeminent existence. No way around it if you're honest to God. No way around it. And here's the link to the article. Hold on. Let me give you the article. Lord willing, I won't see you till next year. Hope you don't miss me. You won't see me till next year.
And Lord willing, I'll do a part three. Here's the article. Save the article, study it, print it, download it, use it in your Bible study Sunday school, re-listen to the videos, hit the like button, pass it on, and guys, pray for miraculous provision, miraculous blessing, miraculous deliverance for this year, for my two daughters, my angels, my love, my heart after Jesus. These angels from Jesus, my heart, Sarai and Zipporah, that's their name, Sarai and Zipporah, pray for them, I see them. Raise them, provide for them. Pray for abundance of financial blessing, especially as we close out the year. God will stir our hearts to partner with me and bless us financially. Pray, I found a place, February 15. I should move in my new place if the Lord opens this door and my brother will be there to help me. Pray, I'm settled here. And that if God wants me to do this, to refresh me, not to be tired, not to get distracted, not to lose hope, but to be strengthened with more wisdom, more knowledge, more understanding, more love, to be more worshipful, more obedient, and more in awe of our God, Father, Son, and Spirit. Christ is dying. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Jesus Christ is Jehovah God Almighty, whose glory Isaiah beheld, one with the Father and the Spirit, and he will come. Sooner than later, we pray. Modern Atha, come, Lord Jesus. Bless us. Bless my daughters. Love them, Lord. And please let me hear from them. Save me from this wicked judge, this agent of the devil. Remove her, Lord, for your glory in Jesus' name. See you guys. Baruch Hashem Yeshua. Take care. See you next year, next decade.